Hi everyone, I'm Kyle, the owner of Velo Mobile Shop. I have a Saunders bike with me today, and this is a customer's bike. As you can see, it does have a few things added to it, like mirrors and lights, a uh, sticker on the top, different seat, but on the inside, where things really count, it is totally stock. This is actually a bike from the 2015 Indiegogo campaign. So it has the 8.8 .8 amp hour bottle battery, the 15 amp maximum motor controller, and that has the Bafang 350 watt motor as well. What we're gonna do is change this bike, and when I say change, I mean we're gonna bring it alive because we're going to change this out for a 48 volt battery, we're gonna put in a 25 amp motor controller and put in the very high torque 750 watt Bafang hub motor. This is a very easy process, but I have had a lot of questions about it, so I'm gonna show you step by step how to change the battery, controller, and the motor. And while we're at it, since we're adding that much power, we're also going to upgrade to hydraulic brakes. Because if you're gonna make your bike faster, you should probably think about stopping too. So step number one is to start removing the things that we don't need. So we don't need the battery in here. Thankfully we have the key, so that makes it easier to remove. It's already unlocked. And that pops right out. And then we can remove the battery cradle. We are going to use a piece of that later. So we'll get back to that. But to remove the cradle, you just remove these two bolts right here. Once we have those two bolts out, battery cradle pulls out, and we can unplug it from the controller. And now the motor controller, and they're a little hard to see, but you have four bolts, two on the top and two on the bottom, and you'll use the same four millimeter Allen wrench to remove those. Now that we have all four bolts removed, holding the controller in place, we can unplug all of the connectors. So you don't need to worry about which connector goes where. The upgraded controller has all of the same plugs except for one extra, and they're color-coded. There are two red connectors for the brakes. Doesn't matter which one's which. So we'll just go ahead and unplug everything in the battery box first. And then we have the largest wire here goes back to the motor. So we will go around there and unplug the motor cable. And then we can pull this all the way out. And here on the other side is the motor cable. We just unplug it. There are a couple of spots welded onto the Saunders frame that hold the cable in place. You just kind of twist it to the side and work it through. There we go. Fish that through the battery box. And the old controller is done. And like I said, we're going to replace the brakes as well. If you're not going to replace the brakes, you can skip this step, but we're going to loosen these up with the three millimeter wrench, and that way the grips slide right off, and we'll do the same to the other side. Now we're going to loosen up our brake handles. Don't need to pull that all the way out, just loosen it on each side. There we go. And to get the brake lines all the way off, we're going to need to loosen this cable here. And for this cable to come all the way out, we have to remove this piece on the end. You can either give it a nice firm tug, and sometimes they'll pop off, or if you have to, you can just cut it right there. And we've got our handy park tool cutters here. 
The same goes for the front caliper. Loosen that cable right up and that will be able to slide out in a moment. And now that we have everything loose, we can pull this out. So what you want to do is line up these holes just like so. Then you can bring the cable out and the other side. We'll get these guys lined up again. And now we can remove the cable for the rear brake. We'll go ahead and pull the brake levers off. Get these out of the way. Now you'll have this cable going back to the controller, which we already removed. So we can just fish those out of the box. This is the cable going all the way back to the rear brake. We'll just pull that all the way out. And the cable for the front brake. Can also be removed. I'm gonna move on to removing the rear wheel. For that, we're going to flip the bike over. Now we do have the screen and the lights and the switch still on the handlebars. You could loosen those and rotate them underneath, or you could just grab a couple of foam blocks or cardboard boxes, rest your handlebars on that, and that way you don't risk damaging your screen or anything else you have mounted on the bar still. As always with working on a bike, you're gonna need some metric tools for this nut and this one. We can loosen the chain tensioner. That doesn't need to come all the way off. You just loosen it enough so that when both sides are loose, you can slide the wheel forward into the frame a little bit and get the chain off. I have an 18 millimeter wrench for the large nut here. We'll loosen that up on both sides. Now with the rear wheel loose, we should be able to slide it forward. You can see the slack in the chain now. And we can pop that right off. We'll undo the motor cable from the frame. Move our kickstand out of the way and slide the rear wheel completely off the bike. So here's the stock 350 watt motor, the stock spokes and rim and tire. We're gonna reuse basically everything here but the motor. So we're gonna save this cap. We're gonna pull off the nut on each side. We'll get this off here. We want to save our washers and our chain tensioner. So go ahead and just pull everything off. There are actually a couple things we won't need, but we'll pull off everything so we've got it off of this side. We can flip this over and do the same for the other side. We have all of the extra bits and pieces off, so now we're going to loosen all of these bolts around the motor case. Now in this case with this motor, I had it resting on the table, was loosening the screws, and the motor popped right out. If it doesn't do that, uh, you can give this a little bit of a tug on the axle right here. This part will just slide right off. But if you tug on the axle, if that doesn't do it, then I would just take it like this, just gently tap it on the table and that should pop it right out even if it's seized up inside that should make it come out so here is the stock 350 watt motor let's see how that looks next to a 750 here is the stock 350 watt motor next to a 750 motor and you can see it's significantly larger so we've got larger magnets more wire in here uh, everything about it is just bigger so significantly more torque can definitely handle 
more power. And you can see that even though they look the same on the outside, the cases look identical. On the inside, it's anything but. Now you can't buy the 750 motor like this. When you get a new motor, it's going to show up like this. So how do we get the motor out? Same process as the 350, aside from one thing, the thing has started changing the screws so they have these uh, anti-tamper heads on there. They've got a little pin in the middle. Uh, not anything too special. You can get the bits for these at the hardware store, uh, but it may or may not be something you have in your toolbox. So just be aware that you're going to need this type of bit. I'll put a link in the description so you know exactly what they are, what size, and where to get them. So here's our brand new motor. We have our anti-security bit installed, and we're going to remove all the screws on the case. Now, since the magnets are stronger on the 750, you may pull on it and it feel very stiff, just like before. Give it a little tap, and the motor will come right out. Sometimes these gears will come out with the motor. I have had times where the gears stay inside the case and the motor comes out. Either way is perfectly fine, uh, but since we're at it, I do like to use the new gears with the new motor. Might as well replace all of the parts with new when we can. Now here's our stock 350 motor case our 750 watt motor and just slide it in. If it doesn't slide all the way in on the first try, the teeth on the gears probably aren't lining up. So just wiggle it back and forth a little bit, turn the shaft here and there and just find it where it lines up and then go ahead and slide it all the way in. And then we could put our screws back in on the case. Now the stock motor had these Allen head screws with this little socket type cap on it. Um, the new screws you can see have more of a pan head style. Uh, see if I can get the camera to focus on those. Uh, but basically the holes here are countersunk on the new motor plate whereas they weren't on the old one. So we will have to use the new screws. You can replace these with something that doesn't have the security type bit uh, required if you want to, but I'm just going to go ahead and reuse these because I have it. Now to ensure that I'm not going to strip anything because we really don't want to strip any of the screws in the motor case, I'm going to turn my drill down a little bit to initially get them tightened down, kind of go in a star configuration. And then once I've got everything nice and snug, I'll crank it up just a little bit. But I want to make sure everything is situated nicely. It's tightening down evenly. So like I said, we don't want to strip any of these screws. And that feels pretty good. So I'll crank it up a little bit and tighten it all the way down. Now you'll notice that we do not have a freewheel on the new motor, so we're going to put a new one on. The old ones are really difficult to get off without breaking. Uh, I've heard of them locking up and causing problems, so now is a really good time to just go ahead and put a brand new freewheel on and eliminate any of those problems. So just slide it over, make sure your threads are lined up. Notice this one actually has notches on it to make it easy to remove if we want to change it out. Slide that on there. Now to get this all the way tight, you can use a chain whip. And you can see it tightened a little bit more than what I could do by hand. 
Now, if you don't have one of these, don't worry, you don't really need it. All I would do is when you first get the bike assembled, before you run the motor, uh, get on the bike and give the pedals a few hard cranks with your feet, not with your hands, but actually get on the bike and pedal it a few times. If you pull on this, then it's gonna tighten it up. Now, what I have seen happen is people don't tighten this all the way down. They get on the bike with a hub motor. Since you can move the motor around this way without pedaling, if it's not tightened down initially, the freewheel can back up a little bit and that can cause you some problems. So just make sure to either tighten it up with the chain whip like this, or like I said, get on the bike, give it a few hard pedals and that'll snug it right down as well. Now you can start putting some of the washers and the nut back in place and you're going to notice a problem when you get to this. This is the chain tensioner and normally that slips right over the motor cable and you can see in this case it does not. And even if we could get it over the motor cable, uh, then we have this nut here that it can't slide over and this washer here. So. What I do, and I would recommend still using this, you know, you could just tighten the wheel down with a chain tensioner on one side and make sure it's really snug, and you'd probably be fine, but we're still gonna use it. What we're gonna do is cut a notch out of the chain tensioner, just large enough so it can slip over the cable. And we're back after a quick meeting with the hacksaw, and you can see notch cut out. That will slip right over that and we can still use it. Still plenty strong enough for what the chain tensioner needs to do. There's really not that much pressure on this. It really just keeps your wheel from sliding back and making sure that everything is set up where it needs to be. Now we are ready to put the rear wheel back on the bike, so just make sure you have the two washers with the notch on the axle, one on this side and one on this side. Now I can put our new motor back on now the only thing you want to be careful now is the direction of the motor cable. There's a notch on one side of the axle and we want to make sure that's pointing forward. If it's pointing backwards you're going to have the cable bent over the end of the axle and if you ever drop your bike, odds are good it's going to cut your motor cable right there. And for obvious reasons that would not be good. Now since I did say I was replacing the brakes, I could have pulled this rear caliper totally off the bike. It is still on there. Uh, normally you'd still have that there. So you have to kind of lift the wheel up a little bit, line up that brake disc like I'm doing here while you're sliding your wheel in. So I have one side slid in. This side needs, still needs to slide in. You'll notice that the frame is just a hair narrower than the dropout on this particular axle. That's because this is a 175 millimeter dropout motor, whereas the original was around 160, 165. So slight difference, that smaller size is not something that's easy to get unless you order in very large quantities. So pretty much everywhere you're going to get a replacement, it's gonna be the larger size. So don't worry, there's a little bit of a stretch you'll need to do right here. Now what we need to do is slide the motor forward enough that we can get the chain back on. Now we've got the chain back on, so we're going to slide the axle back until the chain is not too tight, not too loose. And then we can make sure we have everything bolted down. So we'll get our chain tensioner positioned right where it's supposed to be. And then we'll get our nuts and washers here all bolted down on the new motor. Every once in a while I see someone comment online somewhere and they say that, hey, I'll be walking my bike and randomly it will just start to go all on its own. Well, usually what happens is the chain tensioner is too tight and what happens is when you spin the wheel instead of freewheeling like it's doing now if it's really snug it'll actually cause the
cranks to turn, which in turn moves the pedal assist sensor, then kicks the motor on, which only turns the cranks more, wanting to turn the motor more, and it will just continue to go. So be aware that if you put it too tight, that's the problem you're going to have. So spin the wheel, make sure it spins freely. If you're getting some drag this way, your chain tensioner is probably too tight. Chain tensioner feels good, so we're going to go ahead and tighten up the main bolts on each side. And once the bolts are tight, we can put this little rubber cap back on and we can put the motor cable through the guide on the frame. Our motor, motor is bolted on. We can go ahead and flip the bike back over. Take the piece of the cradle and we'll bolt that back in. And as I mentioned before, this is just to take up some of the slack at the bottom of the battery box that way there's no room for our other battery to wiggle around. Tighten these all the way down. And we're done. This is the style of battery we're going to put into this bike. It's a 48 volt 12.8 amp hour, so about double the overall capacity as the stock battery. Now if we put it in this direction, which is the way you'd normally mount it on a bike, we run into a problem, and that's the fact that although our key is here and we can unlock it, our charging port and our on-off switch are on the opposite side. So since it's enclosed in the Saunders box, we're actually going to turn it around this direction and it's going to be all closed up so you won't see any of this anyway. And we're just going to use a piece of Velcro along the bottom to hold it in place. Before we Velcro that permanently in place, we're going to take our motor controller. Uh, we have two wires that go through this hole down at the bottom. One is the pedal assist that's already coming through. And the other is the motor plug. So we're going to fish that through now that we can reach it before we velcro that battery in. Now, when you get right here up close to that you're going to notice that the hole is relatively snug compared to the size of the new larger motor plug so you may want to push the pedal assist cable through first to give you some more clearance. Push this cable through and it's a bit snug but there it goes and then we can pull the pedal assist cable back. So I pulled that back through. I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. Now we know our motor controller is not going to fall out of the way. We're just going to let that sit there for a moment and get the battery positioned. So like I said, I use Velcro. So here's some industrial strength Velcro. Uh, it doesn't take much, so don't feel like you need to put a piece this long all the way across the bottom of the battery because if you do, you will never be able to get the battery out. So what I like to do is uh, cover up these two bolts so they're not kind of a hard point on the bottom of the battery. But I'm just going to trim off a piece a little bit longer than the distance between those two bolts and that about uh, six inches or so is going to be plenty to hold this battery firmly in place. Before you put your battery back into the box, make sure it's locked to the cradle. That way it just doesn't wiggle around. We're not actually using the cradle to lock this to the bike. The Velcro in the box are what's holding everything in place. You can add a piece to the, the back side of the battery if you want to, but in a Saunders box like that, that's really not necessary. The one piece on the bottom is going to hold it in place. Put 
that right there, press it down nice and firm. And one more trick for you is a piece of paper. If you try and slide the battery in, it's going to hang up on the Velcro and it gets difficult to get it all the way in there. But, if you take a slip of paper and put it on top of the Velcro so it can't grab onto it, you can get the battery in, slide it up and down, back and forth, and when you have it positioned right where you want it, you can just slide that piece of paper right out and it won't move anymore after that. And here you can see how I'm going to have this set up. The controller will sit right here above the battery. The battery will sit here. I haven't pulled out my paper yet, just in case I need to move things around a little bit. And then I've got the wires right here. Uh, what I would suggest at this point is to plug in all of your cables and just give the bike a quick turn on, make sure the motor runs, make sure you don't get any error messages before you cleanly wrap all of these cables up because you want to make sure you don't have any problems that way you're not having to undo velcro and zip ties and all sorts of things to tra track down a potential problem and the other thing I'll mention is you know if you're pushing a bike really hard both your battery and the motor controller or the contro controller more so than anything that's going to generate a lot of heat so if you were running a 35 amp, which is physically larger, uh, for one, it's not even going to fit in the box with this particular battery, but with some triangle batteries and some of the early boxes, it can. Uh, make sure you have some space in between them, or even better, if you're going to be pushing things hard, I would recommend mounting a larger, higher performance controller outside of the battery box. So I've seen some people do it on the back here with a slimmer tire or the best place is usually just along the down tube right underneath the battery box mounted to the frame. So this is a 48 volt 12.8 amp hour battery. Uh, the largest I've done is a 48 volt 20 amp hour with the controller still mounted in the box. Once you go up to a 48 volt 30 amp hour or a 52 volt 20 amp hour battery generally speaking those are all going to be too large and you're going to have to mount the controller somewhere on the outside so just something to keep in mind when you're selecting your controller and your battery you know if you want it to be on the inside that will limit your choices uh, if you want performance i'd recommend mounting on the outside somewhere for this bike we're going to make everything look stock so you're not even going to know it has been upgraded once the box is all closed up so it looks a little messy at the moment we'll clean that up but we've got the important things plugged back in that would be the screen the throttle the pedal assist the motor cable and of course the connection from the battery battery is turned on so we're going to test everything making sure that it works so turn the throttle on turn the screen on everything comes on that's a good sign and then i'm just going to pick up the back wheel for a second hit the throttle and make sure that the motor turns over like it should. Okay, since that works, I'm going to clean up all the cables, get the box closed up, and then we're going to move on to the brakes. Notice I did not plug the brake cables, the brake cutoff switches. You can see this is an extra. Uh, for uh, headlight horn option. Don't have to use that extra cord, I should have mentioned that. Uh, these are for the brakes. You don't need to use those, but of course recommended. I am going to put brake switches on these new hydraulic brakes. Uh, so I'll run some more cables, get that buttoned up, and move on to the next step. The bike is pretty well ready to go, but in no way ready to stop. So I have the Juentech hydraulic brakes I'm going to put on so we can slide that on and we're going to go ahead and remove the stock brake caliper all the way off and get it out of the way. The mechanical caliper is removed and we can just go ahead and bolt the new hydraulic caliper on. So we're going to start with these two bolts and we can tighten these two all the way down. So 
excuse the background noise, this is a working shop all the time. So you'll notice a problem here. We have a hydraulic line and it doesn't go through the guide on the frame because it's closed. So some of these are open and you can put a zip tie or something around there, but not so on the Saunders bike. So what do we do about that? We use a cable guide adapter. All you do is slide this through the existing hole. As far as the line going into the adapter, it just pops into place. So you can position that wherever you'd like. I'm going to position it right up next to the frame like this. That eliminates any chance of it popping out. And I'm going to tighten it down there. Now that we have the front brake lever on, we can slide our stock grip back into place. And we'll tighten these two bolts along with the two bolts here on the brake lever. Now we'll repeat the process for the rear brake, pulling the caliper off and putting the new hydraulic caliper on. And then we'll use those cable adapters along the frame where we need them. Let's again tighten these two up that go to the disc brake adapter, we can tighten them all the way, I have the brake lever sitting on the handlebars, so we'll give that a squeeze, and tighten these two bolts down. And here's how the cable guide adapters look once they're installed. As you can see, nice and clean. It's as if they were meant to be there. Now on this side we have the throttle, our brake lever, and the grip all loosely in place. So I'm just going to go along and tighten each one of these. I'm also going to install these brake switches onto the Juintec hydraulic brakes because they don't come with those. That is going to be covered in a separate video, so I'll put a link to that in case you need it, but we're going to go ahead and skip that, assume that you're not going to need it, and we're going to put these brakes on, and once that's done, this bike is ready to ride and test out. Thanks again for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. Please hit the subscribe button, like this video, uh, feel free to comment and ask questions if you had any questions on anything that we did. And if you've already done this upgrade, especially I want you to comment and tell everybody how awesome it is to have this much power on your Saunders e-bike. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.